looking around, I finally see I think I need a change. The rat race I want to flee, my world I'll rearrange. I'm getting back to the roots of how it's meant to be. Growing gardens, picking fruit, racing livestock, living free. Good morning and welcome to the Modern Homesteading Podcast. This is your host, Rachel Jamison, and I am interviewing Jill and Ryan Grenchik of Great Lakes Treats. Their business resides in Northern Michigan, and I'm excited to learn about how they operate, their foraging, their classes, and their online store. I think you only have an online store, correct? We sell mushrooms at the farmer's market. Oh, too. Okay, I did um, not know that. And then as of recently, some of our products are available in a, a wide variety of different retail fronts. Okay. Um, primarily Northern Michigan. And then um, this last year, we were fortunate enough to be picked up by a distributor. So um, almost every other day, we're learning where our products are. <laughs> That's <laughs> when it comes great. To downstate. Well, that is how I met you. I actually met Jill when I was working at a local small store here in town and we had brought some of her products. Oh, yes. Yeah. And brought some of her products. And I have to stand corrected. It's Jill and Aaron, not Ryan. So um, you call me. Hey, you. <laughs> I, re I respond to a wide variety. My maiden last name was Ryan. Well, <laughs> so that's, that's a common mistake. <laughs> okay. Yes. So sorry about that. <laughs> it's all good. Thank you for so, having um, me today. So what just how about you guys tell me what you do since you guys I'm not probably aware of everything that's going on. I, I haven't seen Jill in a couple of years since I was at that store. So tell me what you guys do. Well, we're really humbled by um, how it's kind of self manifested in terms of the world of mycology and our involvement been just over five years now that Jill and I got certified through the state to recognize 20 different species of wild forage mushrooms. At that point, what did is enable us to provide mushrooms to the public. Um, granted, they're found on private property. And then from there, it's really taken off. Jill and I have been foraging and in the woods majority of our lives. So it's really a uh, a blessing when it comes to providing wild forage mushrooms and wild forage fare to the public. Jill's really taken off and done a lot of the marketing and packaging. I really don't have any personal involvement with any <laughs> of the distribution. Jill is really uh, spearheaded and taken on a lot of the uh, responsibilities of running Great Lakes Treats. So um, we are providing wild forage mushrooms. We have a medicinal tea line. Um, that we're really proud of, and that consists of the turkey tail and the reishi and the chaga mushroom, and then we have a blend. Um, so we really like to highlight our medicinal tea line because we're able to sustain that to the best of our ability throughout the year. Um, a wide variety of the other mushrooms that we offer are seasonal, so we are limited. Um, but it's a uh, you know Mother Nature has a mind of her own. So it really is seasonal and it's also year to year. Our product is a, uh, our product line is continually evolving and um, kind of morphing as um, mother nature adapts to uh, civilization. Yeah. Yeah. So did you guys, I don't know about where, where you forage, but for us, we have our property here in town and we bought some acreage, um, out of our acreage, we struggled with drought. Did you guys have issues foraging this summer with the lack of rain in some of the areas locally? Yeah, for sure. Um, that was the big issue this year. <laughs> um, chanterelles are usually one of our busiest time and that drought and the heat just completely wiped the chanterelles out. Surprisingly, we actually had a pretty decent morel season um, oh, okay. and we found morels in strange spots <laughs> um, like cedar swamps and things where we normally wouldn't have um, thought to look. We were finding morels 
that that six weeks without rain um, oh, springtime, yeah. and then we had another six weeks without rain in the summer. So this was a really challenging year. <clears throat> the chanterelles, as one example, but really almost all the species that we looked for were somewhat limited this year. So it was a, uh, a direct result of you know, the conditions are so finite when it comes to some of the necessary conditions for these mushrooms to fruit. Yeah, I know we we go, we hunt for morels. I mean, obviously not, we're not you guys at all. That's like the only one we trust ourselves to identify properly. And we just did not find, it was just so dry. We we found like four <laughs> and it was like, all right, we get one meal. <laughs> but, I, was putting, um, I was putting on a lot of miles. Um, well, pretty much throughout the entire year. <laughs> I like to yeah. get out there and hike and put on the miles. But in the springtime, at least an average is say like 10 to 15 miles a day. Wow. And that's at a consistent slow pace. <laughs> Um, well, and that's a lot here because we have, we, we have some flat areas, but we also have a lot of hills and, I'm, and yeah, that's a lot of walking on hills. <laughs> so it's, it's rewarding in that fashion, but it's nothing like say 10 or 15 or even 20, 30 years ago. Um, we've lost a lot of ash trees, obviously in Northern oh. Michigan, well, all throughout Michigan, elm tree, the elm borer and the ash borer have really had a negative impact. Those are a couple of the trees that are typically associated with a morel mushroom, as an example, like okay. mycorrhizal effect. And mushrooms have a real mind of their own. I talk about intelligence because they really just uh, can take on different characteristics. And the morale is no exception. So it's oddly enough or uniquely enough, I should say, considered mycorrhizal. But then sometimes the morel mushroom will take on parasitic features or characteristics, I should say. and then also saffrotrophic characteristics and other aspects. And so what I'm getting to is there's like about a dozen different morale mushrooms out there or in the Morcella species. Um, so they really, you know, you think you understand and have a rhyme and reason or you're like, oh, they were here this year. And, um, you know, it's, there's no guarantees. And so it's really, it's almost like an Easter egg on terms of you hope for the best, but Jill coined, you know, what makes a good morale mushroom hunter a couple of years back? And she said, it's somebody who takes the time to get out there and they look for their spots and they f- finally find an area where there's morale mushrooms out there. And then, you know, what you have to do is remember that location, take notes and pay attention to all the uh, key factors like leaves on the trees and the leeks, the wild onions that we have, you know, what stages are those at? And is it an open area? Is it the south exposure? Is it north exposure? Um, we really get geeky when it comes to talking about <laughs> <brown, laughs> No, I love it. I love it. Keep going. I love it. I, this is, um, I really enjoy like deep into the weeds, the really in-depth study of stuff like this. It's fascinating to me. So where did you what made you decide to do this and where did you start acquiring the education? Are you completely self-taught or did you start that way? Did you grow up doing this? We both grew up doing this. My dad worked for the Boy Scouts for 50 years. Okay. <laughs> so we spent a lot of time in the woods and I was always just really fascinated by nature. And same with Aaron's parents. He, We have a picture of him hunting mushrooms in Glen Arbor when he's about four years old. <laughs> it's super cute. So um, for our anniversary, I, I've, I've been on this kick where um, we got married a little later in life and we have a lot of things. <laughs> and so I was trying to get um, to purchase experiences rather than tangible right. yeah. things. And, and uh, the mushroom identification class through the state came up. So I, I bought two tickets to attend that. And um, I had paid that a little extra to get certified thinking, you know, I'll surprise Aaron and, and we can just take this class and blah, blah, blah. And um, so I'm telling somebody about it and they're like, oh no, you have to, it can't be a surprise. So you have to study. It's really hard. <laughs> so about a month prior to the gift, I let him know that we were doing this. And so we jumped right in and, and started really buckling down on identification and learning a few species we'd never even heard of before. And um, um, thank Lord she told me. Yes, <laughs> thank God. <laughs> I, as as um, someone who departed from uh, 
let's say, orthodox education <laughs> at an early age. Um, it had been a long time since I was studying for a test. And so right. the MDARD, which is the Michigan Department of Agricultural and Rural Development in Michigan, they are the ones that do the certification, but it's through a third party that actually gives the test. And so that's an acronym, M-A-M-I, MAMI. And so it's the Midwest American Mycological Info Group, let's call it information. And so MAMI um, provided the test. And thankfully, Jill told me ahead of time because uh, it is one of those scenarios where you do need to do your homework. And <laughs> every five years, they make you retake your test and recertify. So we just recently did that. And um, thankfully, uh, <laughs> we both we both passed with uh, flying colors, and um, it you know it's it's real it's a real humbling experience because we've been able to conduct classes um, through the Department of Natural Resources over the last four years, and then we've also been um, conducting classes independently. We do a lot of education on the spot at the farmers market, um, okay. so we really. Uh, have tried to continue to spread our knowledge and our understanding and develop a more in-depth understanding of the potential. And so the more we learn about these mushrooms, the more phenomenal uh, it is. It's really um, quite amazing when it comes to one of the few kingdoms that's out there. It's uh, it's really been a neat experience as an understatement to um, watch this kind of culminate and manifest on its own. Yeah. Yeah. You guys, I mean, I don't, I can't remember how long it was ago, probably three years ago that I met you. I can't remember, but it seems like you've grown by leaps and bounds since then even. And then um, the whole mushroom thing, like I always just thought, oh, they're good and they taste good. But now we're seeing so much study on the health benefits and, you know, which obviously have been there all along, but we're just now starting to discover just how good all of these mushrooms are for you. And um, it's really cool that you guys are, are doing this. It's, it's changed our diet over the last uh, five, six years now, um, noticeably. You know, as Jill mentioned, we've, we've been interested in foraging for mushrooms all our lives, but this has really opened a wide variety. If, if we would have known all the information that we know now when we were 10, and we have been really styling kids. We probably just would have stayed in the woods permanently. Um, you did stay in the I, woods I, for I, a I did live in the woods <laughs> Did you but really? I, That's cool. I would have had a better diet, let's put it that way. <laughs> you find when you eat these, uh, you consume or drink some of these mushrooms, depending on the application, um, you get uh, more satisfied quicker, like you're fuller, you don't have to eat as much. And at first, okay. that was almost kind of an odd experience. It took uh, weeks and months to for our bodies to adapt into some of these scenarios when you start ingesting and consuming mushrooms that are so dense in nutrient, the vitamin and mineral nutrient, the outer layer they call chitin or chitin, depending on your pronunciation. It's exceptionally dense. And so for uh, that reason, we always talk about how you have to heat these mushrooms in order to um, allow our body to absorb the nutrient. So Jill's really the culinary expert, in my opinion. I, I hit a grand slam uh, in regards to uh, sharing the same kitchen with my wife. <laughs> yeah, that is, I think that, I mean, it's kind of, it's not really about mushrooms, but I do think that's really cool. I mean, our homes, our podcast is mostly about homesteading. And um, I mean, I consider this part of a, a homestead skill, foraging all that because we are not we don't try to pigeonhole what homesteading is we just I, I just feel like it's different for everybody but it's really cool that you guys get to do this together I'm I'm a little bit jealous my <laughs> husband's at work right now <laughs> but um that's really cool so going back to the heat temperature how does how does that work with um mushrooms do they need to be heated cooked like what's the temperature does it depend on which mushroom it is can you get yeah. into that a little bit? Well, we, we were taught during our certification that all wild forage mushrooms have to be cooked. And, you know, there's a lot of debate on that. So um, right. 
I'm not here to say that I know the definite answer to that, but um, with all the wild forage mushrooms that we sell at the market and that we consume, we do cook, fully cook. And it's amazing how much they mimic meat and we're carnivores or, or we're meat eaters too, but um, you know, it's the, there's a shrimp of the woods that looks and tastes like shrimp or a lobster mushroom that looks and tastes like lobster. And a lot of times when you just add, you know, butter or whatever, I can, I can substitute. I have a crab cake recipe where I use the lion's mane mushroom and you honestly would think you're eating crab. <laughs> so. Well, you're a fantastic cook. I can. Um, in reference to the temperature and the heat, I'm sorry. Uh, no, but um, it, you, you're going to have a hard time overheating or overcooking any mushroom. I frequently okay. say that you just don't want to let the pan dry out, but in most circumstances, because of that outer outer cellular layer, um, you really can't overcook mushrooms. Okay. So that's kind of one of the unique features. And you, you can, of course, burn your mushrooms or, you know, have you, but if you've already added enough oil or enough butter, um, throw in some water into the pan, or um, if you're doing a stew or a soup, um, okay. it's okay to let those simmer for a couple hours. Okay. So it doesn't, does, and that doesn't destroy the nutrition, but it does make it, I know that you guys aren't saying that, but you're going by what the state says. It makes it safe. Right. I right. get that. When I talk about canning, I'm like, this is what they say is safe. That's what we're just going to go with what they said, because they're the ones that, <laughs> yeah. Um, do you have, do you guys grow any or, or is everything, um, foraged? Um, for our business right now, everything's forage that we sell. However, we we have for our own personal use. We've we've grown lion's mane, reishi, and oyster mushrooms so far. Uh, we tried to grow wine cap mushrooms, um, and honestly, I don't know. We should probably check that spot. <laughs> they could be up, but I don't think they did take this year. We're, okay. we're looking forward to cultivating in the future, in the near future, actually. So we're renovating um, a section of our warehouse to do that creating a commercial okay. kitchen space there with the laboratory. Um, it, for our own personal use, like Jill has mentioned, we, we have cultivated some mushrooms, but in order to provide to the public, in my opinion, it really has to be done in a sterile manner and right. yep. controlled environment. And granted, you can get a lot of uh, success just plugging logs or um propagating them anywhere on your own property or woods if you're fortunate enough to have woods we thankfully have a little section of uh, just maybe an acre wooded area um, so we have spread all of our spores throughout the years we've taken all of our scraps and um, as we spread those scraps and spores we're trying to associate them near the trees that they typically would grow with if there is a mycorrhiz a causal relationship and then when it comes to like the wine cap mushroom that Joe mentioned, the uh, um, Stropharia species, uh, they call that the garden giant. So this is one that a lot of people could incorporate into their gardens. And that'd be a wonderful way to add a, a bonus nutrient at the end of the season. Um, and it's mycorrhizal with your vegetation. So during dry summers, like we had in dry springs, this mushroom, the mycelium bed, the roots of the mushroom underground are actually sustaining that moisture content so that you're getting the bonus of that relationship coexisting with your vegetation and then at the end of the season after you harvest you've got these beautiful mushrooms towards fall time they got a really uh, burgundy color cap to them so that's why they call them the wine cap mushroom they're f fairly easy to identify so there's no other mushroom that has purple gills true gills or the purple spore print that has the characteristics of the wine cap mushrooms. So that's one that people can, um, they can order bags online um, and then spread that mycelium and propagate okay. it through layers of, let's say, leaves or wood chips. So, oh, I didn't so know that, you could do it on leaves. That's interesting. Okay. It also, there's some talk that it helps the filtration system to remove toxins and, and that kind of thing from your soils too. Yeah, I have actually, so in permaculture, a lot of people, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with permaculture, I assume you probably are, but with permaculture, a lot of people grow mushrooms to remediate soil and then they remove those mushrooms and they'll dry them out and then just put them in like concrete or something like that. Um, but I would assume that it probably does similar things with your body when you eat them. I mean, that's part of the reason why they've become such a medicinal powerhouse for 
We compost every any mushroom scrap, so it, I'm anxious to see in years what yeah. kind of mushroom forest we end up so with. When you say you're composting scraps, so like when I'm like I just I was telling you before we got on air that I was able to get a bunch of oyster mushrooms. So when so when I was like cutting the hard part off where it was on the log. Um, that's what you're saying you composted? We do. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Or we, or we actually just take that hard part and throw that right out in the forest. You know, okay. um, the oyster mushrooms usually grow in poplar, poplar beech trees, I guess. And so we'll try to throw those scraps near some down beach or. <laughs> That's cool. I, I have a lot to learn, but I think I'm going to try to attend. I keep saying this, I've said this for two years, but I need to do one of your classes. Um, <laughs> Do when you it guys comes, go ahead? No, I was just gonna I was just gonna get back to the homestay and part apologize to interrupt you. No, that's okay. Um Jill's really done a phenomenal job. Our pantry has kind of expanded through the years, where I guess that's the one thing that we really haven't mentioned yet is um working with some of these mushrooms in regards to dehydrating them. And so okay. we we do have a commercial kitchen that we have multiple dehydrators. And I guess that's one of the segues where a lot of your listeners could go ahead and benefit is amping it up when they do come across some of these wild forage mushrooms. There are some cautionary tales, <clears throat> like you were mentioning, you can do a bioremediation in cer certain circumstances. And so um, we even talked about the oyster mycelium bags that Paul Stamets offers um, or that he at least has worked with and uh, um, has research uh, success. And then, so that being said, you want to make sure that these mushrooms that you're working with uh, haven't been near pesticides or fertilizers. Um, you want to maybe even do your research when it comes to like some of the old apple orchards. Uh, oh, yes. There's lifetime chemicals that were used, uh, fertilizers in the 50s and 60s, pesticides and such. That, um, yeah. you know, like How do you know if the soil is okay? Well, you really don't unless you do uh, um, testing, but not every forager is going to go through those depths. Right. So what I, what I do encourage is just a, a lot of common sense. You know, if there's mushrooms in your front yard and you find some shaggy mane um, growing in your front yard, they're easy to identify, beautiful, edible mushroom. Um, but again, did the neighbors spray their lawn recently or right. simple things like that? So that's, that's a really valid point. I know when I worked where I, where I used to work and I'm not going to mention the name, but where I used to work, we did a lot of um, testing on some water and stuff like that. And in these old orchards, there's uh, something called MTBE. It was a fuel additive and it was still there from years ago. So yeah, geez. maybe just picking a more wild place to forage for your mushrooms. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they do absorb heavy metals, you know, so if you don't want to pick them near dump sites, et cetera. Um, right. But when it comes to the potential of, um, like I said, remediating maybe your farmland, if you yeah. have an area contaminated, it's amazing the success that we've heard about in regards to, um, you know, overcoming uh, toxicity and such. Yeah, that's a, that's a really cool, especially as we're um starting to discover that a lot of that stuff is not going away and we need to fix that if we want to get healthy it's a great way to fix that do you did you um so outside of your certifications that you got through the state of michigan did you do i'm assuming that you may have done some other um like classes or did you learn all of this on your own or just through these classes? How did that yeah. process go? I mean, I know that you guys have been in it. You probably don't even remember what you didn't know since you guys have been doing it since you were children. <laughs> right. I would say that the majority of what we learned was through the class, um, just the, the workbook and studying that and revisiting it. Um, we also feed off of each other quite a bit. So, you know, he'll say, what's this and what's this? And, you know, we'll, we look it up online or what, you know, we have our, our books. Um, so self-taught. Self-taught. Um, honestly, I, I follow these Facebook identification pages and there's a lot of really knowledgeable mycologists and actual um, 
people that, that know what they're talking about online. I always take everything with a grain of salt because obviously you want 100% certainty when it comes to identifying mushrooms. But just seeing that on checking social media has been really helpful for me. Um, we do have an app that we like to use called Picture Mushroom that'll um, oh, okay. just lead us in the right direction. Again, again, I never, ever trust it because it's wrong often, <laughs> okay, okay. but um, that's good. Uh, then, you know, when we're teaching the classes through the Department of Natural Resources, people are asking us questions all the time. And um, so we're we're always being tested to <laughs> with our knowledge, which is good. And then I also get um, text photos of mushrooms from people often because we reluctantly maybe told <laughs> everybody and anybody that they could send us pictures, but it really has helped us expand our knowledge. So I don't regret that. And and that's I really may good. have done that on Facebook. No, I'm glad you did. <laughs> Please keep doing it. <laughs> now. Normally, my rule is unless I have somebody that's like you, like really, really knows their stuff. My rule is to just look and not, not eat. Yes. <laughs> about like, 50% of the time I say, I think it's this, but I won't ever say a hundred percent certainty unless, right, right. unless it's absolutely yeah, obvious. I mean, you, can get, you can get really sick. Uh, yeah, and there's so many mushrooms that mimic edible mushrooms. So without actually like holding it and pulling it up from the base to see if it has, you know, what kind of attachment it has to the mycelium bed is super important too. And a lot of times people will send me a blurry picture of just like the cap of a mushroom <laughs> and I need to see the underside, you know, does it have gills or does it have pores? And But I will oh. clarify, we're... we're unorthodox mycologist we, we, you know we would probably insult somebody with a university degree when we right. said okay. that we were straight up mycologists <laughs> we're definitely but, not mycologists <laughs> we do pay attention to the best of our ability and the classification of some of these mushrooms has changed through the years and even in the oh. past year um so cross-referencing some of these older um, books in terms of uh, identification you'll find that you're, you're going to come across different names as an example. Oh, that's there's, a good point. There's a pheasant's back mushroom um, that even just in the last five years went from uh, polyporous squamosis to seriosporous squamosis. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure we're butchering that name, but the Latin language is dead. So we, right, get, a, right. we get a free pass. It's open to interpretation. With Latin. <laughs> um, so, so that's, you know, it's a continually evolving and um, we're, you have to really be up to date, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. And, and, okay. You know, Where is the best place to do that? Like, do you guys do that through the Michigan online resources or are you following like the rate latest resources online with i don't know it's a great some, question some mycologists university research is spearheading a lot of it um, okay and then so they're beginning to do dna coding and there's a handful of different individuals that are um, pioneers in that uh field um so a lot of it it's individuals who have taken on the challenge and a lot of it's typically working through university just because of the tools at hand, um, doing DNA coding and uh, actually uh, keeping track and filing of all your discoveries and then matching them up and pairing them to um, what's been classified and known in the past. So uh, genus and species, there's a little blurring when it comes to some of those fine lines. But that's that's what makes it intriguing. And when I start to like you just mentioned the actual chemical that's toxic in the apple orchards, you're you're more educated on that than I am. I just know enough to make myself dangerous. <laughs> um, well, that's where I am too, honestly. So. <laughs> nope. so you know, the one the one home piece that we'd like to hit hard with our classes is if you only take one thing away, it's no guessing. You want hundred yeah. percent certainty in whatever you're doing. Don't ever kind of shrug your shoulders when it comes to wild forage mushrooms um, or any wild forage fair, any berries, any nuts. Right. Um, you really, uh, you know, do your due diligence. I can't make any generalized statements or Jill and I can't make any generalized statements when it comes to these mushrooms, because at some point in time, uh, there's an exception to that, you know, generalized rule of thumb. So it's, you have to do your do your research, cross-reference, do your spore prints, which is crucial, understanding 
where the spores are released with different mushrooms is important. There's a variety, whether they have gills or if it's a polypore or if it has teeth or uh, spindles. There's a wide variety. And, you know, sometimes there's mushrooms like the puffball, uh, the spores are inside. Um, so some mushrooms like that, even though they're edible, there's about 300 different species in Michigan that you're readily going to come across. And about half of those have toxicity to them. Um, so one of the reasons that the small puffball mushroom is not on our list to provide to the public um, is because there's a toxic look alike. And um, to the lay person, you wouldn't know until you cut that mushroom open in half. Um, so there's, you know, that's just one example of you do need to be careful. It's you, you want to jump right in, but jump right in with like one mushroom at a time. If okay. this is new territory, that'd be, you know, a good suggestion. It's also important to keep your mushrooms um, at the right temperature too, because they are subject to food safety issues and foodborne illnesses. So we carry a cooler with ice and a lot of people, you know, it's, I don't think they think about that, but um, mushrooms can harbor bacteria. <laughs> so that makes sense. getting them in a refrigerator in a adequate time. And, yeah, and if you come across a patch, um, don't don't uh, feel bad about taking that entire patch. Frequently, I say like, if you know your neighbors are going to be coming around, save some for them or save some for later. Don't take all the small uh, examples of the fruit. But in our opinion, and to our understanding, you're not going to do harm to that mushroom by harvesting all the mushrooms in one area. Okay. Typically, that, that gets me to the question: um, Didn't you guys get? Um some kind of certification for that, for, for sustainability. So how does that work with mushrooms? You were just kind of touching on that. Yeah. So we, we, uh, the Institute of Sustainable Foragers, right, right now it actually only applies to wild leeks. Um, so okay. we're certified okay. through, through that organization, um, to, which is our dedication to harvesting, um, sustainably when it comes to wild leaves, which we okay. dry into a powder. Um, we have a, a wild ramp salt and a wild ramp powder. And then we utilize wild ramps quite a bit in our own kitchen. <laughs> and so the Institute of Sustainable Foraging, um, you uniquely enough, and it's kind of the morphing of Great Lakes treats. We actually acquired uh, the nonprofit this last year. Okay. So our intentions and our hope is to segue and have it kind of cover a wider spectrum of wild forage fare. Um, and basically it's a stance that's already recognized by the USDA, um, but as Joe mentioned specifically to do with a wild onion that we have, we call them beaks or ramps. Um, but it does make sense in our opinion, and we'd like to be part of that effort to um, create at least some type of parameters of sustainability um, when it okay. comes to um, let's say other individuals like ourselves who are leaning on private property to bring mushrooms to the public, wild forage mushrooms specifically. There's like with the chaga mushroom, that's a very slow fruiting mushroom and it takes years to actually develop to where you can harvest it. You really, really want to be extremely cautious when you're harvesting chaga, not just for yourself, but specifically for the tree and for the, fu uh, the fruiting fungus. It is considered parasitic when you're taking the test, answer parasitic in regards to what chaga is. But in my opinion, in my experience over the last few decades, or last two decades, it's more of a mycorrhizal mushroom as well, and it has a symbiotic relationship with the tree that it's on. And just to clarify, chaga is a fruiting body. It's a fungus that grows specifically on birch trees. So whether it's white birch or yellow birch or river birch, the Petula species, um, you're going to find this conch of, let's say it's like a, almost looks like charcoal. It's a really dark mass. Typically it's exceptionally hard. Um, and it's going to be a living birch tree that we harvest chaga from. As an, um, as an example, if you just take a hatchet and without any uh, concern for the tree, you could do extreme damage. So when I do use a hatchet in certain circumstances, um, I'm extremely cautious not to dig into the tree. And I always leave a perimeter of the outer layer. And I'm not talking about like swinging the hatchet. I'm talking about just a real light at a specific angle. 
And that's only if the chaga won't break off organically. So typically, let's say like eight or nine times out of 10, I'm doing it with my own body weight. And once the chaga piece breaks off, I just leave the tree alone. And I find that's the path of least resistance. Um, sometimes if it's up a little uh, higher on the tree, what I'll do is I'll look around and nine times out of 10, I find this uh, fallen maple branch or tree or a pine tree that's fallen. And I'll use that stick to knock off the chaga. And then by doing that, again, it's breaking off where it wants to. And if I go back to that tree, let's say nine, 12 months later, the chaga is actually starting to reheal and at that point continues to grow. And then three or four years from that point of harvest, if I go back to that tree, I can actually do a second generation harvest. Okay. So by doing certain methods sustainably and being extremely cautious to respect um, not just Mother Earth, but the, the ground you're standing on and the trees that you're working with, you can you can be surprised and, and humbled by um, breaking what other people consider rules of, you know, a lot of people will say, well, it's just a death sentence for the birch tree to have chaga on it. Um, but I've harvested chaga from some uh, old growth birch trees. And then, as I've mentioned, I've gone back and done second second generation harvest. And then in some circumstances, I've even revisited a third and fourth time. Um, and I'm harvesting chaga in a sustainable manner from the same tree that I know it's a maybe two or three or four or 500 year old birch tree. And you don't come across those frequently. Okay. Um, but it's a, uh, it's a unique experience and there's a learning curve by all means. Yeah. I'm learning something here. So you're suggesting, cause I've seen a lot of people take like pole saws and stuff and cut them off. You're, you're not suggesting that. <laughs> it, that's better than, than taking a hatchet and digging into the tree by all means, okay. but it's not the method that I use personally. And I haven't, okay. I, I can tell where people do that and it will heal. But if, if I had a choice, I would, I would just suggest to see if you could break it off organically without using okay. a saw. That's good to know. Cause we actually have a birch tree on our property that has chaga on it. And I'm just, I've just left it sit. And cause I wanted to learn more before I. We were doing a visual. That. We were doing a visual demonstration recently with um, some members of the outdoor channel, I believe through the department of natural resources. And um, thankfully you know, if you get a chance to watch, it was just a real light hit where I just take a little bit of effort. And instead of angling the hatchet into the tree, what I'm doing is I'm getting perpendicular to the chaga and I'm just doing a real small touch. And by doing that, it naturally will crack. Okay. And so that's, that's the method that I use. And, and I stand on the ground and catch it when it comes down. <laughs> 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 so I do, I do a lot of tree climbing. Um, That'll keep you fit. <laughs> what, what's the name of the wild? There's some tree climbing equipment that I've acquired. That's, that's really. Um, oh, interesting. It's almost fun to work with and it doesn't do any harm. There's no spikes involved. Okay. It, it's a rope method where there's a triangular bracket and you tie the rope around the tree, use the bracket and it goes into a stair. And then, so I'll use those in succession. Depending on where I'm hiking, I'll only bring so many with me because when I'm acquiring chaga, it can get pretty heavy, fairly rapid. Um, and so I'll go for longer circle hikes. And um, But typically, if I bring, like, say, three or four of these ropes, I can get up about anywhere from 15 to 20 feet in, in a safe manner. Keep a GPS on him at all times. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. If I don't exactly. see it moving, then I make that phone call. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's a good point. So <laughs> that's actually a good point. Not getting lost in the woods when you're doing this. But so what other tools do you use? Speaking of the tools, what other tools do you typically bring with you in a backpack or whatever? Well, we like there's an app, the Onyx app, um, Onyx Hunt. We use that regularly. Um for one, I can see where Aaron is, and that's helpful, especially when he's out of cell range um, in the UP or something like that. Um, and, and he does a really good job of um, recognizing the topography of the trees. And so he can zoom in and see that it's a old growth, you know, oak forest or something like that or a poplar. And, and um, so that's one of the tools that we use. Um, we also like to drop a pin where we parked because... 
a lot of times we forget he has a great sense of direction, but I am completely the opposite. <laughs> I get lost in the mall. <laughs> I feel that. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, water, some kind of natural bug repellent, the ticks that were terrible this year, oh, as I'm gosh. sure you know. Um, a com- a comfortable pair of shoes. Yeah, backpack. Staying we always, hydrated is important. Yeah, multiple. Yeah. A lot of times we'll bring paper bags for our mushrooms. Okay, um, I was going to ask you about the net mesh or paper. Yeah, well, uh, we have a mesh one that we use most regularly, but sometimes we bring some paper along so that we can separate the species um, because okay. we do like to sort through and relook at each one to make sure that we have the right right mushroom. <laughs> yeah, just, just um, we strongly encourage not to use plastic. I guess that's a big thing. If okay. It's, okay. If it's the only bag that you have in your car and you come across a fruiting area, <laughs> okay. Right. <laughs> but, okay. um, Aaron's been known to take his shirt off. <laughs> no, <laughs> <a bag>. yeah. <laughs> hey, it works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, you know, whatever it takes sometimes by all means. Uh, when even in a paper bag, if you're going to use paper, leave it open. And with just the little bit of wind, you know, it's hard to see with a vis- visible eye, but there's hundreds of thousands of spores being released in that manner. So um, mushrooms will propagate in a couple different manners um, sometimes it is through the spores getting together and creating hypha and then the hypha grows and creates the mycelium etc other times it's the mycelium sustains that life and it's going to continue to fruit through the seasons when it gets back to the tools um, a backpack um, but you don't want to smush any of these mushrooms so you want to be cautious um, a lot of people use a basket or like a rope that holds the basket next to them just for that specific reason. There's a hedgehog mushroom that's pretty frail and it, the pieces will break off as I like to use a basket for that one. A okay. clean knife is always helpful. A mushroom brush is helpful. Yeah. To sand off right before it contaminates your bag with sand as it seems to go everywhere, especially during morel season. The biggest tool, as Jill mentioned, is the... Uh, cross-referencing of the maps previous to going out. So by using Onyx, um, in addition to like the Department of Natural Resources has a wonderful mapping system where you can access um, the state land, the federal land borders, but then their website will tell you how old those trees are. Um, They'll tell you where the prescribed burned areas were of the previous year, which can be important with like the morale mushrooms. Sometimes that's a success. Let's see, other tools would be... uh, not um, our dogs. They're not helpful at all. <laughs> but they can be. <laughs> moral good. support. They're moral support. <laughs> yeah. You know, I guess, I guess, obviously, clothing is important. You want to be comfortable. Dropping a pin where you park or at least knowing where you parked in reference to the map can be really important. The neat thing about the Onyx map is, or app, I should say, um, is that even if there's no cell phone service, it works off a of satellite. So oh, I, okay. I can track myself no matter where I'm at. And so even though I can't get a phone call, I can look at my uh, my phone live time and I can see exactly where I am, where I've been. And there is a tracking feature, but other times I just use the blue dot reference to where I know I parked. That's pretty cool. And it's exceptionally mm-hmm. helpful. Um, even most people's... Uh, like all of our Google or any type of typical phone service has a lot of information um, just in the mapping system itself. So you can get in learn how to drop a pin. Other times, if you take a picture, that's a great um, historical reference where the picture will tell you where you took the picture. It will tell you the time of day, the time of year. And then so a lot of these mushrooms will continue to fruit in certain areas or continue to fruit with a specific tree. So I drop pens as I go, and then I'm learning to take better notes because in previous years I would just drop a pen, but now I've got a couple hundred pens, and I'm like, okay, well, <laughs> which one is which? which one? Yeah. <laughs> now, so I'm learning to just you know get in there, and you can edit and take notes and say, okay, this was um, I was looking for the hedgehog and black trumpets this day, or um, et cetera. So I what? Notes on, on that, that's those. <laughs> That is like really good advice. So that is an app you can get on your phone. Then? Okay. Oh, yeah. Right. It's O N X, and they have a few different uh, versions. And 
it is one that you have to pay for. Um, right. We are not sponsored by them, but thankfully we uh, um, did get some gift cards to the Department of Natural Resources. We have to give them thanks. <laughs> um, right. And then, yeah. And then, you know, uh, um, Onyx, I think you can save a few dollars. That's on Black Friday has a really good, I think it's oh, half okay. off or something on Black Friday. Hey, we're doing this just time. in time. Oh, hey, yeah. That's <laughs> a good time to buy I'll it. I have to tell Harold that we have to put this out before Black Friday. Oh, good. Okay. That's a great thing. <laughs> Yeah, one one good little trick that I learned was if I go to my pictures on my phone and I type in the word mushroom and do a search, my phone will ac actually recognize all the mushrooms that I've found and taken pictures of. And then if I scroll up on that picture, it'll show me a GPS coordinate of where it was. So I can look back to wow. something even before I was certified and say, oh, I found chicken of the woods here in Fife Lake and I can, we can drive there. And, and it's been there a lot of, I'd say like six out of 10 times. That, that is really, really cool. Is that specific to what brand of phone you have? Do you know? I don't know if it's an iPhone thing. I, I think okay. any phone would, most phones. I think most phones, do your phone does it, right? Yeah. A couple of years ago, our, our daughter, Olivia was foraging with us and she made the mistake of setting her eyeglasses down where she was hanging out in the woods and taking a photo. <laughs> and we all went in separate directions. And so we were, you know, maybe in like three square miles all together. But regardless, we all got back to the car. She realized she didn't have her glasses. And I was like, okay, well, you said you were taking pictures, right? And so she's like, yeah. Oh, and so lo and behold, she got into her phone and her photo app and she looked up and she could see the coordinates of where that picture was taken. Long story short, we were able to walk back and Jill actually found her glasses right where she had left. I'm going to have to remember that. <laughs> we went foraging for glasses. So <laughs> take, you know. take a picture. <laughs> so if you're, so in the state of Michigan, they have those classes and obviously if they're in, uh, do other states have these classes as well Thank so, you. Thank we, you. Have, we actually have listeners all over the world oh so. okay excellent yeah i think each state has a certification class okay. and, and actually state by state it varies on what mushrooms are legal to for sale so okay. i was looking at that recently and thinking oh man i'd love to be able to sell bluets or <laughs> whatever um but yeah. michigan limits them there's 20 okay. that we're allowed to sell in the state and then some species of those particular mushrooms Okay. Yep, so the jurisdiction would be state to state to our understanding. Okay. And then globally, um, that's that's one of the wonderful blessings about the world of mycology is when you start to learn some of these Latin binomials, um, you can talk to people around the world um, and you can be on the same page. So with uh, certain regions around the United States, there's what we call slang references to a lot of these mushrooms. So, for example what's known as a beefsteak mushroom in one person's opinion could be different from what a beefsteak mushroom actually is. Um, when I was right. younger, we used to call the gyrometra beefsteaks, but then lo and behold, there is a beefsteak mushroom, uh, predominantly Southern Michigan, uh, to our experience. Yeah, this, this something F I S T Fistolina or species. <laughs> And um, it looks like a beef steak. It, it actually bleeds red. <laughs> oh, yeah. wow. It's a shelf style mushroom, polypore. So, learning the local slang um, and understanding and talking to the locals in each region is exceptionally helpful. And um, of course, that's where you're going to do most of your uh, learning. But when it comes to a global scale, um, one, learn one mushroom at a time. The, the oyster mushroom is the, the pleurotus or pleuratus species. Um, so, you know, learn the different varieties of the Pleurota species in your region. Uh, in Michigan, we have four that are recognized. Um, one of them actually isn't native to Michigan. Uh, the hmm. Golden Oyster, Southern Michigan, is uh, really uh, taken over. It's one of the few invasive mushroom species that I'm aware of. Okay. Wow, I didn't know there was invasive mushrooms. Interesting. So do you have any books you re you recommend or do you not just because the because you were saying the science is changing so quickly? Yeah, yeah, you definitely want to get an up to date book. Um uh, we like Midwest Mushrooms is the one I usually kind of go towards. Uh we have a little brochure that we have for sale at the farmers market that we like to um oh, okay. but uh but yeah, the the website midwestmycology.org 
is the state certification website and they have a ton of information okay. there. That's a really good place to get started with the 20 species that are, uh, they, okay. they say kind of easily identifiable, which I don't really think is totally true, but there's, there's not a lot of um, poison for, us lookalikes on that particular site. That's for the Midwest region, of course. Yeah. So yeah. with, you know, any area you're, you're going to want to find a, a reference book that has to do with your specific region. Yeah. Yes. Um, and then even from there, you know, maybe acquire a couple of them because it's frequent that in these books, I, I see discrepancies. Um, you know, what I mean by that is they'll say, this is Chaga, and they're showing a picture of a wooden conch. Um, so, and this oh, okay. new reference books. And so, um, you know, do cross-referencing in most all examples, um, just because there's a lot of confusion and there's a lot of... Uh, <laughs> misunderstanding there's so much to learn it's not like jill and i we definitely do not even know um close to you know we don't know it all by any means but what you do want to know is um just taking your time yeah there's a lot of mushroom hunter clubs that are in oh, okay. numerous states and i'm sure probably worldwide um, we're a member of the Michigan Mushroom Hunters Club, and, and that always has some really good resources. There's a lot of knowledgeable people on that and a lot of um, talk about mushrooms in general and, and uh, That's cool. need to, uh, even recipes. And right. Like and you were and so you mentioned your website on your website. You said I actually saw the pamphlet that you have for sale. Also, I think is that when you were speaking. Oh, of? we have a different one for sale, but I did. I did oh, make okay. a It's just kind of about the medicinal properties of tea. Okay, I would okay. get that one printed someday too, but that's a, um, available for download too. We're also yeah. encouraging Shell to come up with a cookbook soon. Yeah. <laughs> I started it. <laughs> so. Right? Yeah, maybe a winter project. <laughs> yes, that's the plan. <laughs> and you guys, you guys have a website which you said you sell. I I looked at it. You have some products like teas and dried mushrooms on there, and then you also teach classes. So if you're anywhere in Michigan, you might want to drive to some of your classes. Obviously, if you're in Alaska, you're not going to want to attend your classes, but. Can you talk about your what you your website and your classes? Yeah, so our website is is greatlakestreats.com. And there's a link right on our site for any upcoming classes. Um, we do them uh, like pretty much every month during the season for the Department of Natural Resources throughout the state. Um, I have a cooking class coming up at our local co-op here <laughs> in Traverse City. Um, but you know, we're willing to travel for to teach classes in other oh, okay. areas too. So, <laughs> um, but. Jill did a really good job of getting our, uh, we have a three hour slideshow presentation that we do throughout the, the class typically. Uh, anywhere from like say two and a half, three hours is a typical time for to run through the 20 different species. And then from there, we typically go for about an hour hike or what have you, depending on where we're at. Okay. Uh, so, that information, the three-hour slideshow presentation, is on the website. It's a nice resource just to even glance through it. A lot of it is redundant to Manny's website, which is the, the Midwest American or yeah, mycological <laughs> information one. Yeah, we, we plan to add a commentary to our slideshow, so eventually okay. you'll be able to link to our actual class, um, and we. Okay. Hope to get that out there soon. <laughs> and you guys have, I think, I saw that you have. A class coming up in is it March or April? We do it, here in yeah. Traverse City. We have a class on April thirtieth at the Grand Traverse Commons um, area at the cathedral, the historic Cathedral Barn, which is a beautiful venue and uh, it's open. I do throughout the class. I hand out some food samplings of some various mushrooms, whatever we can find at that time. Hopefully, maybe morels and pheasants back, and I'd say oyster mushrooms, perhaps. Okay. <laughs> Depending on Mother Nature, and it's a really good time. We uh, hike the grounds at behind the cathedral barn, and there's a there's a wide variety of trees and lots of different mushrooms to be found up there. I think I'm going to have to make myself sign up for that one. <laughs> it's far enough out that I can make it happen. So, well, how far with your classes? How far do you feel comfortable traveling, considering the fact that um, obviously the mushrooms change where you're at and all that stuff? like just within the state of Michigan or like the Great Lakes region, if somebody wanted to have you come? 
Well, as of recent, um, it's it's been primarily just Michigan. So we've got down to like Bay City. Um, Pre-pandemic, we actually were considering doing almost like a tour throughout the 10 different visitor centers that the state has um, oh, cool. in regards to the DNR. Uh, but uh, we would be humbled by any opportunity to travel out of state. Um, of course, we would want to do our referencing and uh, we'd have to be a learning experience for us by all means. But there is some practicality when it comes to going through the checklist of identification. So that's, you know, Joe mentioned we, we're, uh, we're a good team in that way where um, combined, we can typically narrow down what mushrooms we're looking at or where to, where to go and um, what to do. And so a lot of times it's just giving people the confidence. You know, yeah. To, to mention uh, what's learnyourland.com. Um, there's an ad. We, we follow a YouTuber that we just love. It's it's Adam Harrington from learnyourland.com. Okay. And, and this guy is genius. He, he's just phenomenal. His videos are available. And um, one of the things that he mentions in one of his videos is when you go to the grocery store, you can really just check out and you can just grab stuff off the shelf and you can just start acquiring whatever food items you want without thinking about it. But when it comes to wild forage fair, you really have to be conscious and you have to be in that moment and think um, with some common sense check marks. And so giving people that confidence that you too can go out into the woods or your backyard and positively identify these mushrooms. And then in some circumstances, being patient a day and seeing what the spore color is or doing more cross-referencing. But typically, if you're gonna to try to do mushroom identification, take a picture at the top, you take a picture of the bottom. As I mentioned, do a spore print, which is fun to do. Basically, you take the cap and put it down on a piece of paper, cover that mushroom with a bowl or even like a cup. Um, sometimes spores are released fairly rapid. Sometimes you have to wait a day or two. Um, oh, okay. But then giving yourself the confidence that you too can also identify these mushrooms. Um, so. You know, it's a lot of it is just getting over that hurdle of of uh, confidence and not being afraid to pick them. You can touch any mushroom, even the most deadly of a mushroom, oh, really? yeah. or touch it. So that's good um, to know. <laughs> yeah, that is a misconception that that touching mushrooms is dangerous. It really is not. But I typically say, don't lick your fingers. Yeah, now. maybe don't lick your right, fingers. right. <laughs> Some That's good to know. There's actually a picture I shared on Facebook of a mushroom I found and I wasn't touching it. I was just going like this because I was afraid to touch it. <laughs> the toxicity levels of some of these are, are uh, they definitely make it so there is a risk factor and that's where the 100% certainty comes in. Right. Um, the toxicity of some of these mushrooms can be delayed even. And so you won't have any difficulty or onset for like say 10 to 15 days, sometimes even weeks. Um, oh, wow. So you, there's there's definitely reason to have caution. There's some mushrooms that um, there's a lot of discrepancy and discussion about because people are like, well, I eat those. And well, you can get away with some of these toxins for a while, but like ammo toxins will build up in your body because our body's unable to digest those. And so through time, you won't get sick, maybe the first or second time, but eventually you're gonna have some type of uh, you know intestinal failure. Um, so, uh, some of these mushrooms will get you sick into the hospital right away, six to 12 hours later. And some can be rendered edible, uh, you know, by, by boiling in a well-ventilated area multiple times. And, you know, okay. we don't, we don't really get into that. Um, just, you know, I don't right. want to risk it. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. so we, we know for we, sure. We feel ultimately responsible when it comes to providing these mushrooms. You know, thank God we've, we've really done our due diligence, um, but there is that responsibility, uh, yeah. even even within the species. You want to, you know, fresh is best. Condition is is crucial. You know, there's mushrooms like the honey mushroom, where it, even if it just fruited that morning, same thing with oysters. Sometimes these little bugs will get into these mushrooms, and sometimes the bugs are harmless, and you can just knock them off. Other times, it's actually already burrowed itself all the way into the cap, and you don't want to consume those mushrooms. You want to discard those. Unless you want to eat beetles. Yeah, so it might be extra protein in some of those circumstances. <laughs> right, right, right. Those are the ones they, they, you they, toss they, in the compost, right? Yeah, there you go. That's and they it. always say eat a small amount at a time too, um, to to see if your body's going to reject them or you oh, know, yeah. to, if yeah. you have any kind of an allergy to them or something like that. Especially the honey mushroom and the chicken of the woods are two that can cause gastrointestinal <laughs> issues. Um, 
So, you know, there's several of the mushrooms on our list. There isn't really a lot of problems. And, and so, but there's an individual by the name of Chris Wright. And unfortunately, he's no longer with us, but almost 100, well, a lot of the information that Miami has on their website and a lot of the information that we've acquired in the certification class was all based on Chris's work. So let's say 10, 15 years ago, there was only a few people in Michigan, particularly that were certified to recognize wild forage mushrooms. And then Chris came along and he went to the Michigan uh, uh, the MSU. Uh, Michigan State Extension? You no, know, oh. he was in uh, the University of Michigan oh, okay. uh, State. And anyhow, Chris culminated the development of, M of NAMI, the, the, the group that works through MDARD. And really, I just like to go ahead and at least give him props because, as I mentioned, he made it so that the layperson in Michigan, particularly, um, can go ahead and get certified themselves. And so you don't okay. necessarily need to have an interest to get into retail sales or anything right. that's, or it can just be an extended education experience. Okay, um, that's cool. So you can kind, of like, kind of like the master gardener course where you don't necessarily have to do your hours of, um, you know, you don't necessarily have to become a gardener for other people, but if you're interested in your education, you can do that. So so my, that. My, my prolonged sentence, I guess what I was trying to say and reiterate with what Joe just mentioned is he didn't make it like mushrooms for dummies, but he did make it that the 20 different species that were allowed to provide can be easily identified. And okay. so his, his brilliance shown through a little bit in that form. Uh, the porcini, for example, we're not able to sell wild forage porcini in Michigan. Other states, I believe you can. Um, but the reason is, is because there's a bitter lookalike that's verbatim. Okay. And, and so how do you know? Well, you really don't know until you do a little taste test. And then are you going to be selling people mushrooms that you took a little nibble out of? <laughs> no. Um, there are some toxic bullet lookalikes too. I, it's So keep it, keeping things simple, um, starting with just a couple, but at least when it comes to our region, um, if you do your due diligence, you can, you can identify the 20 different species that we're allowed to provide. That's, that's really helpful. It's, that's like the mark, that's the mark of a good teacher being able to teach it. So people understand. So sounds like he was a great teacher. Yeah. And the fact that he uh, shared his knowledge is, is brilliant. That's great. Well, is there anything else you guys would like to add as we start to wrap up? We usually start off all of our classes with giving thanks to everybody. Um, you know, thanks to the state, thanks to MDARD, thanks to Manny, thanks to people like Chris. Thanks to you and, for having us on. This. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly my next statement. So we're just, we're humbled by these experiences. And so we we also encourage anyone, everyone to reach out. Um, you know, we, we typically are able to respond within 24 to 48 hours. There are exceptions to those rules when we're both uh, in an area where we can't get cell phone service or internet. Right. But yeah. beyond that, um, Please, uh, you know, reach out, say hello, especially if you're in our region. And um, thank you so much for having us, Rachel. Well, thank you so much for coming. I've really, really enjoyed it. And I enjoyed all of my conversations every time I've, I've spent time with Jill. And you guys are an inspiration to me. So um, I appreciate the time that you guys have taken out of your day to come so I could interview you. And I will have all of this information, which I'm going to have to listen to this again, I will put all of your information and then some of the links to the websites and stuff you talked about in the podcast notes. Great. So, okay. Well, if you have any uh, questions, just reach out any anytime. Too. Okay. Well, you guys have a wonderful week and I'm going to end the podcast with my usual that I say, grow where you're planted. Looking around, I finally see I think I need a change The rat race I want to flee My world I'll rearrange I'm getting back to the roots Of how it's meant to be Growing gardens, picking fruit Racing livestock, living free It's a Beans 
like Grandma did, sitting on her front porch, hunting and fishing like a kid. Once you've done all of your chores, it's a modern homestead. Build a modern homestead. Country or city, there's a way to make this change. You gotta start today.